Representatives from nearly every nation have met this week at an annual climate summit, searching for agreements on how to curb the rise of global temperatures. The summit is being held in the oil-rich United Arab Emirates, and that has dismayed activists who believe that the only way to really address the climate crisis is to walk away from fossil fuels. For the moment, at least, the world and the United States need both fossil fuels and renewable energy, and the best proof of that may be found in the state of Wyoming. It is the country's leading coal-producing state and very conservative politically, yet its Republican governor, Mark Gordon, is emerging as a leading voice promoting climate-friendly energy projects and action to address the climate crisis. Essentially, Mark Gordon is trying to prove that it is possible to be both red and green. The story will continue in a moment. We needed to be aggressive and we needed to really address this issue. So you tell the people of Wyoming that climate change is real. I do. And that it's urgent. It's an urgent crisis. I have said that. And I've gotten, I've gotten some pushback from that as well. I bet you have. <laughs> <laughs> in September, we met Mark Gordon, who's in the middle of his second term as Wyoming's governor. How are you, Ellington? On the cattle ranch where he grew up. This is my dad's old saddle. His family still owns this ranch, and he and his wife also operate another about 40 miles away. How did growing up here affect your worldview? I think growing up here gave me a, an enormous appreciation for the world around us and, and the ecological processes and the weather. You just are uh, exposed to it on a, regular, on a regular basis. Mark Gordon is also a mountain climber who has seen glaciers receding due to a warming climate. He says that helped convince him to set a goal of making Wyoming not just carbon neutral when it comes to CO2 emissions, but eventually carbon negative. You first made this pledge of net negative CO2 emissions at a 2021 State of the State speech. How did that go over? I think some people probably resented it. I think generally it's been well respected. Uh, it was, to, to some degree, a bold move and, and one that was intended to make a difference in that discussion about energy in the future. After Gordon repeated his net negative emissions goal at an appearance at Harvard in October, Wyoming's Republican Party passed a vote of no confidence in him. But he says heat from the right won't deter him from pursuing what he calls an all-of-the-above energy policy. Whatever you're going to do in energy, probably you're going to have something to do in Wyoming. We have tremendous wind resources. We have the largest reserves of uranium, important for nuclear energy, the largest coal producer. We're number eight in oil, number nine in natural gas. 83% of our energy is exported. That will soon include nuclear power from a next-generation reactor to be built in Wyoming with a $500 million investment from Bill Gates. Huge wind farms already dot Wyoming's landscape, with the biggest one yet on the way. Because the wind blows basically 24-7, 365 days a year. Bill Miller is president of the Power Company of Wyoming, which is beginning to build what will be the largest wind farm in the continental United States, in the middle of a geographic break in the continental divide. All the winds which blow from west to east pretty much are funneled through this part of the country. Miller drove to the top of a place called Choke Cherry Knob to give us a taste of the wind. So when this is up and running, how many turbines will be out here? Current plan calls for 600 turbines. And how much energy will that generate? So they'll generate around 12 million megawatt hours of power and a that's year. A, and that's enough to power how many homes? A million, million two. Wyoming doesn't have anything close to that many homes. It has the smallest population of any of the 50 states. So the plan is to build a new 800 mile long transmission line to send that power to California, which needs and wants it. What's this gonna cost? The wind farm 
will be something north of $5 billion. The transmission line will be something north of $3 billion capital investment. That's a big investment. Yes. The project is bankrolled by billionaire Philip Anschutz, who owns the company Bill Miller Runs, and who first made his fortune in oil. Society has spoken. That's what this country is going to go to, is renewable energy. More importantly, it's a project that contributes to the zero carbon initiatives that we strongly believe in. It's going to happen, and this is the best place for it to happen. At this past summer's windy groundbreaking ceremony for the transmission line, Bill Miller was joined not just by Republican Governor Mark Gordon. We have a great future ahead of us. But also by two members of President Biden's cabinet. The way we've tried to navigate this is to find something for everyone. And I think that's is that possible. The, yeah, I think it is. Honestly, I think if people are going to embrace how we get to a carbon neutral, carbon negative future, it has to be by saying we're all going to be a little bit better by embracing innovation. If a single picture can capture Wyoming's energy past, present, and future, this may be it. A fully loaded coal train passing in front of a huge wind farm. Remember, this state still produces more coal than any other by far. The likelihood that we will truly, as a world, move away from fossil fuels is very low. Holly Krutka runs the School of Energy Resources at the University of Wyoming. Before shifting to academia, she worked for Peabody, the largest coal company in America. 82% of our global energy consumption is fossil fuels. 82%. 82%. It has not changed. Because of that stark fact, Krutka and her colleagues are focused on taking the CO2 out of fossil fuels like coal before it reaches the atmosphere with a technology called carbon capture and storage. There are carbon capture and storage projects in America working right now. There's just not enough. The capture side, we're there hmm. today. We can do it now. Right now. Yes. The technology is there, but is it economically feasible? It will always be cheaper to do nothing than to add carbon capture and storage. If you want to reduce emissions, this is part of the solution. We have to decide, is it worth the cost? At the huge Dry Fork coal-fired power plant near Gillette, the University of Wyoming is operating what it calls the Integrated Test Center. Some of the flue gas that would otherwise go up the smokestack is siphoned off into labs like this one, where the Japanese company, Kawasaki, is testing methods for making carbon capture more economical. Wells 10,000 feet deep have also been drilled to show that captured CO2 can be stored underground forever. How big a deal would it be to find a, an affordable way to capture carbon at the point of admission uh, say in power plants or, or around the world. It would be a game changer for certain. You know there are a lot of naysayers who say that mm -hmm. this is a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. It'll never happen. What do you say to them? How do you convince them? Well, I say we're trying it. Then I know people will say, well, you're just trying to extend the life of the coal mines. Mm -hmm. I am. But I'm also trying to do that in a way that is going to do more for climate solutions than simply standing up a whole bunch of wind farms or sending up a whole bunch of solar is. With his all-of-the-above approach, Mark Gordon is trying to put every kind of energy project on a fast track, including Bill Miller's huge wind farm. How long did you think it was going to take when you started? When I originally started, I thought we could probably get this entitled and under construction within five years. And it's been 17? 17. Why so long? Primarily the permitting process, the bureaucracy of the federal government. You told me coming up here that the, the process was kind of like a nightmare. It was difficult. <laughs> Maybe nightmare is a little bit too strong, but uh, it was a very difficult process. So how important is it to reduce regulatory and permitting barriers? I think it's massive. Permitting reform, I think, is one of our biggest challenges at a federal level 
It is something that's being embraced uh, by both sides. Both the Biden administration and congressional Republicans have endorsed the idea of streamlining permitting for energy projects. Actually doing it is another story. In Wyoming, Governor Gordon has done what he can. One thing I can share is that it's a state that's very welcoming to innovators in the energy space. Cully Kavnis is co-founder of a company called Crusoe Energy Systems. About five years ago, it decided to tackle the problem of flaring when gas produced at oil wells is simply burned into the atmosphere. If you could capture it all, it would power about two-thirds of Europe's electricity. It's a very large amount of waste. And we're just burning it off. We're burning it off because there's no pipeline there. Kavnis and his colleagues came up with the unconventional idea of putting a small electricity generating power plant right where that gas was being flared and wasted. What we do is we tap into that gas line, we bring the gas over to a power generation system, and then that generates electricity, and we take that electricity directly into our on-site data center to power hundreds or thousands of computers, and then we network the computers to the outside world with fiber or satellite internet to get it off-site. So you take a data center and just basically put it on top of the wellhead. Exactly, it's a, it's a modern data center in every way when you're standing inside of it. And then you step out the door and you're in an oil field. Crusoe Energy first used those electricity gobbling data centers to mine Bitcoin. Now, most of that computer power is being used by artificial intelligence companies. The first place to let them try this in 2018 was Wyoming. That's not necessarily an idea that everyone's going to embrace automatically right off the bat before it's been done before. Wyoming was. They invited us to come do it for the first time here. We did it at a small scale. We proved that it could work. And that helped us attract the funding and the other projects that have helped us scale to where we are today. How many of these um, centers do you have up and running currently? We're approaching 200 by the end of the year. We'll have about 200 of our modular data centers deployed throughout the United States and now internationally. So how do you assess your environmental impact? So today we're operating at a scale of more than 20 million cubic feet of gas per day that would have otherwise been flared and wasted. We're preventing that flaring. It's on the order of several hundred thousand cars per year being taken off the road in terms of the avoided emissions impact. Are you trying to send out a message to the rest of the country, maybe even the rest of the world? If you have a renewable or a climate-friendly idea, bring it here, bring it to Wyoming. Love to. We, we want to be part of this solution. There are some really remarkable things that if we stop talking about what we shouldn't do and start talking about what we can do and how we can embrace that future, and that's what we're dedicated to here in Wyoming.